This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program, Living Legends, Collection. There is no original date given for this interview. The interview was conducted by Mr. Frank W. Sprague, that's S-P-R-A-G-U-E. The interviewee is Mrs. Archie Stetler, S-T-E-T-L-E-R, of Kingfisher, Oklahoma. This interview is being re-recorded on August the 22nd, 1985, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. We are interviewing now Mrs. Archie Stetler of Kingfisher, Oklahoma. This is Frank W. Sprague conducting the interview. We're happy Mrs. Stetler can be with us. As we understand it, she was born and reared here. Her parents were pioneers. And Mrs. Stetler, we'd like to have you just begin at the beginning and tell us, if you will, about the run when your folks came in here. Several relatives, I believe, came in with your father. And then tell us something about your early days here. Well, I was not with them when they made the run in 89. Father left uh, mother and, grand and my uncle's wife and so forth out in the panhandle or the no man's land. He and his father and his brother and his brother-in-law made the run and uh, didn't go back for the family until they had built dugouts for uh, the three that were on along the uh, Clear Creek that ran through the three farms and a rock house for my grandfather and grandmother temporarily. And then uh, I'm sure they did some plowing and then went back and brought the family my uh, oldest uh, sister told me that uh, she, they had lots of cattle out there, and she and the one five years younger than her uh, drove those cattle through. And uh, she said that uh, the uh, younger sister could hardly stay on a horse, so didn't uh, know, couldn't do very much help, but then they managed it, and she said the cattle got tired and were not hard to handle after a day or two. But they drove them from no man's land clear to Kingfisher and southeast of Kingfisher. And uh, I don't know why. Well, this is certainly a good beginning. Now, let me ask one more question. I remember when I lived here some years ago in Kingfisher that I was told that the west boundary of this uh, territory was just shortly, just a short distance west of Kingfisher. So there was a west boundary, there was a north boundary, an east boundary, and so on. Now from which direction did your folks run? And then also, were the men all on horseback or were some of them in vehicles like a buggy? For making the run, they were on horseback. However, in a buggy was my grandmother and uh, a younger, uh, and a sister the third one in the family, and they were on the west boundary, and the uh, buggy and grandmother and sister were left there while the four men made the run and then came back to the boundary for them. This boundary was just, uh, oh, a very short distance west of Kingfisher. I would say a mile, not more than a mile and a half. And... Uh, the men uh, did some plowing, I know, before they went back to the uh, to get the folks in uh, no man's land, the rest of them. Yes, thank you. The reason why I was asking is because uh, my folks came in to the Cherokee Strip running from the Kansas boundary south toward Enid four years later. This was, of course, in 1893. And the stories which I remember being told as a child was that my three uncles came in on horseback. They were young, husky fellows. Grandfather was not well, so he and another man rode together in what they called a buckboard. They were fortunate. They all got farms north of Enid. 
But of course, the men on horseback would ride for maybe two hours or more coming in. And so I was wondering about your folks in that regard. Now, as I understand it, your father got a claim southeast of Kingfisher, just a short ways out. You might tell us something about your memories of your childhood home. You were born, I believe, two years after the opening here. Yes, I was. And I was born in the dugout that they had made. And uh, I can just barely remember when the frame house was uh, being built up on a higher plane of ground because this dugout was right in the bank of the uh, creek. And uh, my, the older ones in the family had to go to school and walk two to three miles for, I believe, a kind of a dugout school. Might have been sod house and dugout combination. But uh, before I was ready for school, we had a nice wooden schoolhouse a mile and a half from home to which we walked regardless of the weather. And, uh, well, it was a very enjoyable time to me out on this wonderful farm. We stayed there until uh, 1903 when Father sold it for various good reasons to my oldest sister and her husband, and we moved into town. He bought a small business here. And uh, in fact, uh, what we would call those days oil and gas business, but very different to what it is today. He had uh, four wheels with three tanks on it, and he brought one horse in from the farm and went all over town filling people's uh, uh, containers with uh, gasoline for their stoves and oil for their lamps because those days there was no other way to have light and heat excepting wood, wood stoves, wood and coal. And uh, he kept that up until uh, the uh, automobiles began to come and uh, that kind of put him out of business but I guess he was glad to retire. Thank you. Now let me ask another question. The Rock Island Railway, of course, passes through Kingfisher. Was the railway here when your folks came in in the early days, or was it built a few years after the opening? Well, since I was born here, I can't say for sure that it was here, but I rather think it was. There was the Chisholm Trail that uh, went through here just a little bit west of uh, town. But I believe that the railroad went through here clear into Texas, even in 1889, but I, I'm just not dead sure. I imagine this is correct because I know when my folks came into the Cherokee Strip, the Rock Island was from Wichita, clear on down as far as clear us down as far as Enid at least, and so I suppose it was already through this part of Oklahoma. Now let's ask another question. How much schooling did you get here? Did you go clear through high school? And then uh, we remember that there was a college here for some years. Tell us about your connections with the schools. Oh yes, I went to through uh, the grade, finished the grade school and finished high school. And uh, Long, quite several years before I finished high school, I became uh, involved in the music department of the college and uh, kept that up as long as there was a college here. But uh, I was married not too long after I finished high school. However, uh, uh, before we finished high school, there was a professor at the college named Professor Drake, a wonderful voice teacher. And, uh, oh, he just did wonders for this community. He uh, taught us the, not only the pupils from the college, but a number of us from here in Kingfisher, the Messiah. And we had uh, weekly practice all fall and winter and until... Uh, 
in the late spring, the Messiah was sung for the first time here in Kingfisher. His wife was an elocution teacher, and they put on so many plays. Oh, I wish I could think of a few of them. But uh, there was always, we had a big uh, old opera house, wooden, that these would be given in. And uh, there would be the students from the college and then we who sang in the choruses from here in town with them. And we just had a wonderful time. Professor Drake uh, stayed with the uh, college until it uh, closed. closed in 1922 due to financial difficulties. But he didn't leave Kingfisher. His uh, physical condition was he was in a wheelchair and, and by that time, long before that. And he stayed here until he passed in uh, 1936, I believe. And then his wife stayed on uh, with uh, conducting the uh, choir in the Methodist Congregational Church. They had united. They came here formally. The, well, our college was a congregational college. And then uh, later, the, it, uh, after the college went under, why the two churches went together. And uh, Ms. Drake uh, kept it up until uh, she passed along about, fifth, I believe, 55. But uh, we have always felt that Kingfisher was so richly rewarded by having those people here because we all uh, felt so much like we knew so much more about music which to us was very very wonderful yes i have heard many fine things about kingfisher college and i remember very well mrs stetler that when i was living here some years ago some 16 years or more ago i was in your husband's radio and TV repair shop one day and noticed a bunch of old phonograph records of opera music. I asked about them and he explained that they were some which he had picked up after one of the music teachers of the college had passed on. As I recall, this was some woman music teacher and apparently she had no immediate heirs and Mr. Stetler had bought these records or acquired them somehow and he asked if I would like to have them. I said I would. So then I had these records. They were, of course, the old 78s, but they were of Grand Opera, Aida, and others. I remember distinctly that one of the records was from Enrico Caruso singing. And when I retired a few years ago, we were, of course, trying to clean house and get rid of things. And I asked the music department in the Baptist University at Shawnee if they would like to have these records for their library. And the head of the department said he certainly would like to have them. I sent, sent them down to him by a messenger, and he wrote me a lovely letter thanking me for them. So you'll be glad to know that these records finally wound up in a good music library. Now, let me go back to your earlier days as a child here, as a girl. Did you have some close friends from among the Indian boys and girls? Were they in the public schools with you? Oh, no, indeed. They, uh, there were Indians here, yes. And they uh, sat with their shawls and all on the street corners and everything like that. But as far as being, uh, they were not in the schools with us at all, or as far as being close friends, they were not at that time. Of course, conditions are different now, naturally, with all. But uh, not those days. Going back to the music of, uh, of Kingfisher College, Professor Drake had us, uh, I know I sang in the uh, sextet from Lucia and the uh, quartet from Rigoletto and uh, things like that. And oh, oh, it was just so wonderful. And the, I know I appreciate the music, the good music I hear on television Oh, a million times more than I ever would if it hadn't have been for my experience with the uh, professor and the students of Kingfisher College. And uh, one, oh yes, I want to tell you that uh, up until this college closed in 1922, there had been three Rhodes Scholarships. 
And at that time, there had never been that many from any college in the world. And there is one, I used to could have told you all three, there is one of them still living, and his name is Claude Vogt. And uh, he is still active in the... Uh, uh, associations that we have had every three years for the college, reunion, reunions, I think I should say. And now they have changed it to every two years because the older ones seem to be uh, going away so fast that uh, they'll be every two years now, from now on. And he is still a remarkable man. I remember when we lived here, which was something over 16 years ago, these reunions of Kingfisher College were being held in the old hotel, which has since been torn down. These reunions would last two or three days, as I recall, and people would come from all over the country. I was amazed to find that people had come in from the West Coast, for example, and uh, the college had been closed at that time over 30 years. So we were amazed and impressed by the loyalty which these folks had to their college. May I ask another question now? When you folks were learning good music out here at Kingfisher College, did you have any opportunities of going to some place like Oklahoma City to visit an opera which might be put on by a, a touring company? Did you have any opportunities like this? Well, I would say yes. And uh, may I uh, say that in, after learning the Messiah, there was uh, a few times that we would go over to uh, one of the churches in Oklahoma City and uh, sing with them the Messiah. And then possibly the next year, they did a few times, they'd come over here and sing it with us. And we enjoyed that association very, very much. Before... Oh, I would like to tell you of something of my grandfather. May I sure. interrupt in that? In the early day, when I was almost too young to remember, there was no church or Sunday school out in this community where we lived, and he couldn't stand it. He wanted a Sunday school for the uh, not only his grandchildren, but the neighboring children. So he built an arbor in his backyard and put... Uh, I don't know, straw and limbs and stuff over it to, to shade it, and that summer and had Sunday school in his yard for the neighborhood children before a church was built out there. Then uh, grandfather and my father and my father's brother were the uh, main ones in organizing a church, and it became the uh, United Brethren Church. My maiden name was H-O-W-E, Howe, and this church was called Howe Chapel, and it lasted for many years. We came to Kingfisher in 1903, and they, I think the church lasted out there until in the uh, 20s sometime before it was given up, and the building moved to a smaller town, Reading, I believe, for their work over there. I'd like to ask about the song, Oklahoma, A Toast. We were guests a while ago at a luncheon of a civic club here, and uh, one of the songs which was sung was this Oklahoma, A Toast, which I had learned as a child in grade school and always liked it, of course. I remember distinctly Mr. Bowman, who is now deceased, but who was a prominent attorney here, telling me some years ago that he liked this song very much and he much preferred it to the new song, Oklahoma, from the musical comedy. And uh, may I ask, I remember that this song, Oklahoma, was written by someone connected with Kingfisher College. You might tell us about it, please. The uh, man who we give credit for Kingfisher College was Reverend Parker. And he had several daughters, and one of them wrote the song, Oklahoma. It's a wonderful song. And uh, she, uh, let me see, his youngest daughter is still living in Dallas, Texas. The one who wrote the other daughters and the one who wrote uh, Oklahoma, of course, have passed on. But, uh, oh, it is wonderful. And I have uh, 
felt very critical of myself and others that we didn't know and uh, get over to Oklahoma City when our uh, uh, officers over there were changing the song and fight for it being kept. Not that I dislike the present uh, state song, but it just seemed like it would have been right for this song to have kept as uh, been kept as our state song. I miss That's wonderful, Mrs. Stetler, and we certainly do thank you for this information. Now may I ask another question about some of the, some of the ordinary day prob everyday problems in early days here. For example, this matter of uh, getting a doctor when there's sickness in the family, or taking someone who's sick to a hospital. This must have been a problem in the early days. We know that Kingfisher has a very nice hospital now, but how was it some 50 or 60 years ago? Well, it was all just uh, home work. The doctors came to the home and uh, did whatever they deemed necessary to do. And uh, Kingfisher's Hospital hasn't been here. Well, it's been here quite a number of years now, but then... I'm sorry, I don't remember just when, but it seems to me like it was in the 50s. Would that be about right? I think so. It was here when we were here. We came mm -hmm. here before. Well, mm -hmm. it hasn't been maybe in the early 50s, I'm just not sure. But uh, the doc I know out on the farm, when we were ill, my father would have to get on a pony and come to town if uh, we needed the doctor and bring a doctor out there. But we didn't rely on doctors as much as they do these days. Father had his own home remedies that he made we children take. <laughs> and he thought that avoided so many trips to the doctor. I'm not dead sure how the other people did, but I presume the same way. <laughs> Thank you. Now, another question about life in the home in the early days. This will be of interest to young people who will be hearing this tape. Everyone nowadays has an electric refrigerator. We used to have, we used to have ice plants or ice houses in some of the towns, and I remember that when I was living here in Kingfisher, there was an ice manufacturing plant here then. I don't know whether it's still operating or not. I doubt it. But tell me how you kept, uh, well, milk from spoiling or a few simple things like that in the early days before you had refrigeration. I know it was a problem. Well, on the farm, my memory is that uh, they had to be let the butter and butter did at least, be let down into the well to keep it cool, to keep it from just melting. But uh, the milk was in uh, large crocks, and it would uh, clabber, and Mother would take the uh, cream off the top to churn it to make the butter. Then after we came to town where we could have a refrigerator with ice in it, why, of course, we didn't have that problem. Everyone had a refrigerator, and the ice man went by every day and if uh, whoever needed ice could have it every day, just according to how much ice the refrigerator would hold, whether they would need it every day. So that was, that was very helpful. I'll still take the electric refrigerator. Yes, I think most of us would like the electric refrigerator in preference to the old system. Okay. But all this brings up one other matter, of the, the matter of rearing small children. I remember some years ago visiting a cemetery out at Old Fort Reno, when Mr. and Mrs. Bowman from Kingfisher were there, and Mr. George Brownlee, who was with the newspaper, and uh, this younger man was quite interested in noticing how many graves of infants with little stones were there, and he asked about it, and I explained that uh, infant mortality was quite a problem in the early days. I think I can remember vaguely a saying that if a child would make it through the second summer, they might make it all right. The first summer, they'd be still nursing. The second summer, they'd be weaned and switching over to other food, and this was a problem. So many children died of what they call summer complaint. Would you care to speak about the problems of rearing small children? I'm sorry, but I just, uh, my memory doesn't go to that at all. <laughs> I guess I was too young when we moved into town. <laughs> Mrs. Stetler, we'd like to ask a question about uh, 
your work. I understand that you have been employed here in Kingfisher a great deal of your adult life. First, I believe, in a department store, and then perhaps later in the courthouse. I may have this in the wrong sequence. And then you might tell us a bit about your family. Well, when I was in high school, I worked in the dry goods store here and on Saturdays and then during the summertime until I was married. And then, of course, uh, I had three children, and I was pl plenty busy at home until they were grown and married. Then I worked several months in the county clerk's office at the courthouse. Then I went uh, back to the store and uh, worked a few years. And in the fall of 1954, I became a deputy to the court clerk here in Kingfisher, working uh, part-time. There were times that I worked full-time, but mostly part-time from then until <laughs> the last was just before Christmas of 1972, but I didn't hand in my key until not too long ago because the new court clerk told me to keep it till she asked for it, but I decided it was time for me to retire, so I am doing work at home now and church work too. Well, I had three children, and the oldest one, when he, uh, he finished Kingfisher High School, as did all three of them. And um, about that time, let's see, that was 1930, and they, um, he went to Phillips University. He was quite a musician, and he received a scholarship at Phillips University at Enid, so he went up there one year and uh, joined the uh, oh, military. Military. Yeah. The military. Well, the, um, oh, what is the name I want? Band? No, he was in the band, yes. They visited many, uh, he was a wonderful clarinet player, and they visited the towns all around and had concerts. But um, he got interested in the service so that when the um, when the war uh, came on the second world war why uh, their uh, 45th division uh, were mobilized and yes the national guard is what <laughs> and uh, they then he went to Lawton and they were sent down to Camp Barkley and on the way down, there was a, they were passing by his unit, a car that was in trouble. And uh, he stopped. His officer just hired and he said, well, that isn't one of our men. Well, Donald says they're having trouble and they need help and I can help them. So he did. And he received a letter from a high up official who had passed by and seen the incident, praising him for being so considerate to help these people. His, the Stetler family have always been wonderful in uh, mechanics of every kind. So he was able to do that. And because of that incident, when the 45th Division went overseas, he was, before they went overseas, he was taken out and made an instructor at Fort Sale. And uh, when they were fighting over there, when they were fighting over there, he said, Mom, when he came up, Mom, I ought to be over there fighting with those boys I trained with. And I said, Son, you only have two feet and two arms and two eyes and so forth. You are teaching hundreds of boys something about mechanics that will help the world in lots of ways. But it hurt him awfully bad to think that he wasn't over there fighting with them. However, when the war was over, why, uh, he was, uh, became a civilian for a time. And uh, they uh, want the government asked him to go to Turkey to teach the Turks to take care of uh, the American machinery that was being sent there. 
and going as a civilian, he could take his wife and two little daughters with him. So they landed up in Turkey, and uh, he was there almost four years. While there, a son was born. They uh, was an American hospital in Accra, and uh, his wife was flown there for the birth of the son. And now, this son is in the service, in training. Then my second son was, uh, oh, due to some law about in the army about teeth that goes back to the Civil War days, why well, he could enter into this service like the older son did. There was a clause in the laws about it that prevented him from going because of some false teeth he had. So he uh, volunteered for the British Technical Corps and went to England. And uh, while he was there, he was sent up to near Lincolnshire and was taught the radar. The British Technical Corps and went to England. And uh, while he was there, he was sent up to near Lincolnshire and was taught the radar business. And anything that he would mention would be do taken out, cut out of his letters, of course, that came home. He finally learned what to, he could write and what he couldn't. But uh, after he had finished school up there, there were about three boys put in a little place on the southwest uh, corner of England. And um, uh, nothing to do. Well, he couldn't stand it. So he uh, wrote to the to headquarters and said, I believe if you'd send me back to the States, I could help your country a lot more than I can being here idle. And boy, he was sent home immediately. And he had a telephone call not to volunteer for any service until they got to talk to him. So he was put over at Tinker, I believe it was Tinker Field over at Oklahoma City, servicing the planes with radar, but the word could not be used at all. That was all a deep secret until the war was over. But he serviced the radars as long as the war lasted. Thank you, Mrs. Stetler. And I remember you told me a little while ago that some of your folks were the ones who had the first garage to service automobiles here in Kingfisher. We probably ought to ask you about that. Well, I was in high school, and there was uh, two or three cars of the wealthy people in Kingfisher here that had cars, but very, very few. And um, here came uh, M.O. Stetler and his sons, well, his family, from Hennessy. And they opened the first garage and filling station in Kingfisher and uh, sold the Ford car. It was really quite something. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, his sister, my husband's sister, got a job in the store where I was working. And I knew her before I got acquainted with the rest of the family. But in, finally, I did meet her brother. And, well, eventually we became married, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Stetler. We certainly have enjoyed this opportunity of talking with you. We've been hearing about the early days in Kingfisher from Mrs. Archie Stetler. Thank you very much.